Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to A Plus D Mondays, to our first Monday of the spring semester, our first Monday night of 2020 here in this beautiful theater. Welcome. Um, if you don't know, my name is Shannon Jackson, and I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design, in addition to being a professor here. Um, and it's a privilege to welcome you to another semester of fabulous programming, including the launch of A Plus D Mondays. A Plus D Mondays is one program amongst many supported by, by my office, the Ber uh, Office of Berkeley Arts Plus Design, that is established to create a kind of, establish a kind of glue function amongst all of the different creative fields, departments, centers, institutes, museums, presenting organizations um, on what is actually an incredibly creative campus in um, the greatest uh, public university in the world. Um, and it is a, a place where we imagine new courses, support new creative pedagogy, creative career festivals, including one coming up on February 10th, students take note, uh, as well as uh, we support something called the Berkeley Arts Passport, which offers subsidized access to the arts uh, on campus and off campus to enrolled Berkeley students. If you haven't downloaded the campus mobile app and looked on the Arts Passport, I encourage you to do so very soon not right now, uh, uh, and to see all of the different offers that we have for you and more that will follow. Um, as I said, A Plus D Mondays is one amongst a few programs um, created uh, in order to facilitate collaboration, and it's one co-curated by some dozen departments and schools on campus, including the Art Practice Department, the School of Journalism, uh, the Jacobs Institute for Design from C College of Engineering, and of course tonight's major sponsor and producer, the ATC series of Berkeley Center for New Media. This Monday series also has another function now, increasingly. It's uh, gathered and a place to offer to students a an interdisciplinary space for thinking across creative fields, across relationships between arts, technology, and social good in various ways. And about 50 students or so, I hope most in this room, have signed up for a course entitled Explorations in the Arts and Design. Uh, can, if you are one of those enrolled students, can you raise your hand? Okay, yay, and a lot of them are now in the front. Good, good to know, as you should be. Uh, this is a, a vehicle that we use to deepen students, those who choose to deepen students' engagement with this series. And so this is my first moment to welcome you all to class. This will be your classroom every Monday at 6.30. And also to remind you um, and maybe also to tell community members and non-enrolled students about some of the things that we are going to be thinking about throughout this course. So, first of all, are Maya and Sean here? Can somebody get Maya and Sean? Okay, and we'll, we'll bring them in. But to reinforce the plan that we told you, we want you to be thinking every, every night throughout, um, throughout this um, series about three central themes and some associated keywords. So, a reminder, think about technology, all of the different associations that are attached to that term, and we're really gonna be thinking more about that dialectic between the human and so-called artificial intelligence. And when Ken Goldberg comes up, he's gonna give you a frame to help you think about that even more. Creativity, an overused word. Um, what does it mean to you? Um, also really thinking deeply about that dialectic between form and content. What are the mediums, the techniques, the formal attributes of the of, and processes that artists use next to the questions, the content, the themes that they're pursuing? And then the third central theme is, of course, always a Berkeley theme, social good. All of the different ways that we are working, say, and you find artists or speakers here invoking issues of democracy and power, equality and authority, about what it is to advance social justice in the midst of um, a, a very, very uh, complex world in which we live. Those three themes, technology, creativity, social good, are gonna be swirling in different ways with some foregrounded and some more backgrounded by different speakers and we're going to be asking students to think deeply about those words, 
in relationship to certain speakers, and then across the entire series. And guess what? Anyone who's not an enrolled student, think about those themes too. Uh, it might provide a bit of traction just as we're going through all that we have on offer. It has been always great as somebody who's now, I think, co-produced this series for over three years now. Incredible to see the number of ways that students and community members make connect the dots amongst the things that we have on offer here across creative forms and social themes. And it's always been such a pleasure and continued privilege to work with the faculty who bring these compelling speakers to our campus and to this beautiful theater um, uh, every time. And Ken Goldberg, who I'm going to invite to the stage, is one of those faculty members, the founder of the ATC series at Berkeley Center for New Media, who it offers such inspiration. So before stepping down, I want to ask everyone, first of all, to make sure that you've checked in with Maya and Sean, if you are an enrolled student, because we do take attendance. There they are, raise their hands. And the second thing I want you to do is to thank this team and my team, um, Paris and the BAM PFA staff and my colleague Ken Goldberg for being um, people with whom it is a joy to work. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Well, um, this is a relatively new program. We've only been doing it for 23 years. And in fact, tonight's speaker is number 213 on our roster of our technology and culture speakers. And it's been a real delight to do this. I have to say, I see Eric Paulus over there. I think you were at the first one in 1997. And it's, so, it's, such a, it's such a pleasure to work with the Berkeley Center for New Media, with Shannon, and the, and the campus with, the, with the, um, the Pacific Film Archive and Berkeley Art Museum. And, and what I wanted to say is, is, is that we are now in the year 2020. And it's, it's gotten off to a, a kind of a bad start, I would say. I was, had higher hopes, but now we're, we, have, we had wildfires, we have assassinations, we have impeachments, we have uh, coronavirus. And um, I'm trying to find some good news here. Uh, a lot of deaths. Um, not to be all doom and gloom, but it's, it's, we have to take stock here. It's a, we're in an interesting moment. The other maybe glimmer of interesting positive news is that we're also in the, the second century of robotics. And by that I mean that it was 100 years ago in, 20, in 1920 when the word robot was coined. So as of 2020, we're now 100 years in, and the word is very resonant. It's been used as a metaphor and powerful for many, for now 100 years. And in particular, in terms of a framing that Shannon mentioned, I want to, I, I, something that we've been thinking about this year is the idea of exoticism, about treating others as something foreign and exaggerating their both positive and negative attributes. This is a very, a, lot, a huge amount has been written and it's, and it's very important to keep this in mind in the contemporary moment. But it, I, I believe that it also applies to robots, that we tend to exaggerate their, their, their positive potential and all of the, 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 the what they're going to achieve, and we also exaggerate all of their negative potential. And this series, we, we brought in some fantastic speakers to study that question from a variety of different perspectives. And I hope that the, the, the new group of students here will, this will be something you'll take into consideration. I think it's something that's not, that's, that's not easy to wrap your head around. It's, it's certainly controversial, but it's a way of thinking about robots and putting them into context of what's happening in the rest of our world with populism and inequality and polarization, trying to understand where robots and technologies more broadly fit into that. So without saying anything more, I'm just going to turn the speaker over, I mean the, the podium over to my fantastic, wonderful colleague, Lisa Wymore, award-winning dancer, scholar, and department chair. Lisa, please introduce our wonderful speaker tonight. Hi everyone. I am so excited to have Amy Leviers here today to talk to us. I um, make work with computer augmented technology in choreography and so it's so fun to, to have someone here to talk about this and uh, how creativity and robotics can blend and intersect and uh, inform one another. So Amy Leviers is currently an assistant professor of mechanical science and engineering at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign 
which is also where I graduated, so go U of I. She is certified movement analyst, trained in law and movement studies. She has a PhD in electrical computer engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering and a certificate in dance from Princeton University. She's a dancer since the age of three and she is now working to make robot controllers that are more adaptable for a complex future, a future that requires robots to perform more diverse tasks within rapidly changing environments. At the University of Illinois, she runs the Robotics Automation and Dance Lab, also known as the Rad Lab, which is such a great name, I love it, which uses robots and dance to study movement and engage with the process of automation. The lab engages in outreach programs like the Games Camp, where young people learn about robotics. The lab also supports a wide variety of research projects that cover topics such as ethical and comfortable building monitors, automation for the elderly, and creating new stories about robots that redefine traditional narratives. The Rad Lab also supports workshops and residencies. Her research interests include embodied movement studies, which we'll hear about tonight, which I'm very excited about, movement control, uh, movement notation, supervisory control, optimal control, human motion analysis, and high level control of robotic systems. She is the co-editor of Controls and Art, Inquiries at the Intersection of the Subjective and the Objective. The book includes projects on a disco dancing robot, a reactive museum exhibit, and otherworldly computer generated music. Professor Leviers was awarded a director's fellowship and a young faculty award from DARPA. She is a recipient of the Calvin Dodd McCracken Senior Thesis Prize from the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Princeton University and the Lyman Page Dance Award from the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University. Please help me give a warm welcome to Amy Leviers. Wow, um, I'd love for Ken and Lisa to just give my talk because that was such a beautiful introduction. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited um, to be here today and to share um, a little bit about my work. Um, Dancing with Robots, so the title of this talk, uh, already I think invokes a certain level of exoticism, a certain level of those two things maybe shouldn't be next to one another. Um, like if I said cowboy and castle, right? You, you think, oh, why would be, you know, there's something, as Ken talks about this idea of polarization or things that are far apart being put together that creates what I think of as sort of a cheap interest, actually, in a lot of what I do. And, and I think, because there's this initial, like, oh, yeah. And then there's um, maybe, maybe not always the tools to engage on both sides of things. So I hope that the, t the talk tonight helps. Um, another uh, pair of words that might seem exotically paired um, of medieval robots. And I, when I read Ken's ideas about robot exoticism, and this book is like the book that everyone should read, and, and my talk cannot, um, cannot really add to this in, in some way, but, but I want to use Ellie Truitt's idea of, of how she talks about exoticism in this book. And, and in particular, and as an engineer, you know, I never took any history classes, so I could barely um, get through this book and understand it, but it's really important text about um, why and how we think about machines and technology, and um, particularly being here uh, in the US and, and deriving a lot of our understanding from the medieval times. And, and she writes something that I didn't realize, which is that in those times and in the Dark Ages, uh, people thought that, that magic existed, first of all, and that magic was not equally distributed around the world. And that the edges of the world, which of course were the parts of the world far from, from Europe, contained more magic than the parts you know, in, in Europe. And that's why they didn't see as much magic, but it was out there. And what else was out there, and what else would people would go out, and when they visited places like Babylon or China, they would come back and they would bring writings about these 
fantastic machines that were encountered out in these far reaches of the world where um, um, people were more scientifically creative than in Europe at that time. And so people wrote about it as if it was magic. And I think we inherit, and what she writes about so beautifully is how we've inherited that otherism that's associated with technology um, even maybe still today in ways. Um, so this idea of things two things far apart being exotic, I do this all the time when I put robots and dancers on stage together because people think, oh, how exotic, how, how you know, spectacly. And, and I came to robotics from a very different uh, level of interest um, in the sense that I, you know, I never would have gone to graduate school or become a professor if it weren't for dance and if it weren't for my interest in understanding how dance works. And, um, and I think that informs maybe a different uh, point of view on, on robotics. And I just wanted to start and give you like a little simulated experience of like the last 10 years of, of my work uh, just at the start of the talk so that, that we're all maybe re reoriented to thinking about robots from the point of view of dance a little bit um, just through a series of motivating questions. So I'm gonna, the first motivating question and the first question that I got really interested in is, is what are all the ways that a human can move? And I think this is what you study in dance. How can I change the way I can move? How can I add to my repertoire of movement um, and, and availability to express different ideas? But from there, maybe things got uh, a little different because I started thinking, how do we quantify two distinct styles of movement? How should one rehearse with a robot? What does it mean for two distinct bodies to move in unison? How does movement accommodate the environment? How are principles developed in dance studios useful in factories? Why does dancing feel so different than programming? How will moving mechanical objects in our environments change human-facing environments? How many ways can a human walk? How many ways can a robot walk? Is movement a continuous or discrete phenomenon? Are these doing the same thing? Are these doing the same thing? Which of these tools would you rather dance with? How does it feel to move alongside a robot? If you move with a machine, does it change how you feel about it? How can people more efficiently translate intent to machines? By what measures do robots outperform humans? And by what measures do humans outperform robots? What structures can be named leg, arm, hand, and the like? What new ideas can robots help us express on stage? How do you show people that their bodies are powerful and creative? Can machine bodies express the same ideas as human bodies? And when they haul me off to the funny farm, this is the question that I will be screaming. Because I think, I, I mean this in a, in a serious way. Is it possible to express the same set of ideas with this little white robot as it is to express with my body. And I think my experience, my observation, is that often in robotics there's an assumption that yes, of course they can. And I think it's really important to challenge that assumption, that maybe that's not really true. And of course, I hope, I think we forget it because we, we, we attribute so much to this word robot. But 
hopefully that at least for this simple humanoid, it can be seen that, you know, well, it only has like a, like a three appendage hand. So it can't hold up five fingers and it can't hold up four fingers. So there's already sort of a counterexample of things that I can express with my body that it can't um, with it. And, and another question we could ask is, can they express the same number of ideas? Uh, which I think is maybe a relaxation of that same question. Um, but again, just underpins a lot of what I do and how I think about robotics. So that's my little quick 10-year timeline of lots of projects that we've done in my group and, and that I did in my PhD and, and before. And, um, and now I kind of want to check in on, like, where are we now? What do we think about machines and, 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 and robots now? And there's been a lot of work um, kind of on the internal side of things, right? Everything I'm talking about is very external. But on the internal side of things, we've had a lot of interesting progress. And I want to use an example from artificial intelligence um, to, to start framing. Um, this is the Nature article that describes the, the, the achievement of a computer algorithm um, beating a human Go player. And there's two interesting things about this paper. If you control F, learn, uh, all the forms of learn that are, appear in this paper, except one, are modified by words like reinforcement, supervised, unsupervised, policy gradient. These words that mean a lot of technical stuff that is modifying the verb or the gerund or the you know, form of learn that, that, it, that, it follow, that follows it. And when you go and you read popular media, you will see sentences like this. Oh, oh, and if you, if you control F taught or teach, it doesn't appear. Taught and teach don't appear. But when you go and you read popular media, you see sentences like this. He was beaten by a machine that taught itself to play the ancient game. Pushing far away the creators and the programmers of the thing from the thing itself. The second quote is maybe worse. Humanity didn't stand a chance. AlphaGo uses programming modeled on neural processes to replicate human instincts, and also uh, human instincts, something biologists don't understand. We don't know this, what human instincts are, right? But, but this was replicating them. And has learned through millions of, of, of matches against itself. So these verbs, learned and taught, appear. And they don't appear with their needed technical modifiers, right? like policy gradient. Um, as they do in the, in the nature of the technical article. And I think this is um, interesting because these verbs are the verbs that we also use to describe human behavior. Um, and then when we lop off these words, it, it changes the sense of what the word means. And it, it, it suggests uh, maybe a little more, attributes a little more than, than is, is reasonable. And, and in the movement world, we're even lazier about it. Right, I'm standing up here talking about dancing robots, and, and I don't have any modifier in front of dancing. Um, and I, I like to use the example of the backflipping Atlas robot. So this is a robot that made a big splash recently because it could do a backflip off of a block. And these are the quotes that a variety of, of, of articles um, add, you know, co comments that were made about this robotic backflip, um, you know, jaw dropping. Olympics ready, which I actually find a little offensive. Like, the, 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 this, this, the Olympics is a venue for the most incredible human movement and achievements in human movement, and, and, and this, this first backflip is already ready for the Olympics. And I want to use this example to set up two ideas about movement uh, that I hope make sense. So here in this picture, um, I have this the snapshot of a human doing a backflip and then a snapshot of that robot doing a backflip. And in this moment, what I think you see and what I think you see when you watch a backflip is like this one angle, like roughly, you know, pick, pick a, pick a, um, uh, a fiducial on the, on the person and we're watching this arrow make one full revolution. And that's one number. And, and we can measure the speed of that angle. We can measure the velocity and the force of that angle. And, and we can see that if we did a similar thing on the robot, that, that arrow would maybe make a similar, would definitely make a similar rotation. 
Um, and we could also compare things like velocity profile and force profile. And, and in the sense about velocity and force and, and precision and repeatability, machines have been for decades outperforming humans, right? Both on the large end of that scale where we have large magnitude of force and on the small end of that scale where we have small magnitudes of force. Um, there's this, this incredible ability to prescribe force for machines. And I think that's what, what, what these quotes are noticing. And, and it's completely true, and it's completely incredible that this robot did a backflip. But well, there's another angle to it, too. And I'm going to use the last moment of the backflip when the robot lands and then reaches its arms up. And in this moment, and I've got a different uh, a gymnast that I'm comparing the, the robot to now, but, but in this moment, there's a lot of, it, it, well, what's important? The, the, the vector has made its rotation, and now it's upright. And what we see on the right with the human is um, an expression of success, right? She could also be hunched over, right? And, they would, and she would get a lower score, and it would modify sort of how we see what she's done. Um, and the way she can do that, hunching, slump, versus exalt, is through this spine that she has, right? And all these little vertebrae, vertebrae that are in the spine that allow her to create different shapes that modify the actions of her limbs. And this robot doesn't have that. And what's also interesting is when you watch people try to explain backflips, they talk about initiating from the pelvis, this big heavy weight that we carry around and we use uh, quite a lot to control our movement. And when you watch the backflip of the Atlas robot, it actually initiates the backflip from the ankles. And I think what's so incredible about watching the robot backflip is how differently it backflips, not so much how much the same it backflips. It uses a very different strategy. And, and here, to describe this posture, I can't use force and torque and acceleration because it's actually about all these different numbers that would describe all the different positions of the vertebrae in the spine. And so it's about how complex and rich, how rich this moment is. Very different point of view. The first point of view is Newton, straight up, like force equals mass times acceleration. And I'm, you know, if, if acceleration is large, that means there's a large achievement. And yet, that doesn't help you extend your spine and differentiate from this pose and this pose. Because both of those, you know, maybe roughly use the same kind of force to achieve. So what is the other way we could think about movement? Besides watching this one single apple fall to the ground or this one single object rotate 360 degrees. And that is really through the lens of information. So these little fish are actually really well studied. A lot of roboticists um, think about creating multi-agent systems that coordinate with one another. We know that the fish, you know, one fish moves and the neighbor fish follows along. And that's what creates the schooling pattern. And if a shark swam up, all the little fish would disperse. And that movement of its neighbors is then informative to this agent and to its ability to survive. Um, on the other side, we have um, dancers. And they are also coordinating in a similar manner. The movement of the, each dancer informs the movement of, in this case, probably all the other dancers, but definitely the two dancers that are physically attached by holding hands. And that's what allows them to create this shape. If they, if they couldn't sense each other, they'd be all over the stage and we wouldn't see a circle. And we also see, similarly, uh, in this situation, we have two men in very similar postures. We interpret a very different meaning from this. We're not even seeing the motion, in fact. We're just seeing a static snapshot from it. But we, we sense something different. So let's think about information a little bit carefully. And I'm going to introduce um, a famous model of communication, which is Shannon's model for communication. And in this model, there are, well, roughly, let's say, three parts. We have, on the left side, we have this information source. And we have to build something to encode. That information source could be like, how many, you know, wh which record of Michael Jackson's records am I playing? 
right? It's a piece of information about the world, and I have to build something to encode it, and then I have to communicate it across a channel uh, where it may pick up some noise, and then I need a receiver, another built system, to receive that message and decode it so that the information gets to the destination. And all three of these pieces are distinct from one another and are essential to successful communication. And I'm going to kind of sloppily you borrow this um, model to talk about robots and humans and movement. Um, and I'm going to think about this picture. So I'm going to think of a robot as a source, an information source, slightly different than like you know, an acceleration jockey, right? I'm interested in how rich can the source be, how many different things can it encode, and then I'm going to think about the channel as the environment or the context in which the robot is situated, and then I'm going to think about the receiver as the human that's watching the robot in a particular environment and what, what meaning is created for that person. And um, this model makes my engineering colleagues somewhat happy. Um, and I'm going to think about the art as an adjust, you know, this, this border or this, uh, this, this outer frame is that I'm going to think about the stage and the theater as a test bed for understanding and characterizing all these other three components. So I want to start by talking about this test bed, and I want to um, um, frame uh, uh, a bit what it's like, you know, working in these two fields, the dancing and the robots, right? And on the one side, and I'm going to, these are pictures of classrooms, uh, you know, an, one is meant to be an engineering classroom, one is meant to be a dance classroom, and, and I want to notice something completely, well, a very obvious feature of the two, which is that in one, you know, you're sitting in these chaired environments, and you're really focusing on intellect through thought and through internal calculation and memorization and, and, and the way you're sitting in the chair is not going to affect your grade, right? It's very internalized. And on the other side, we have the dance environment where everyone's rolling around on the floor and, and what's valued is, is as much, of course, your intellect, but also the, the patterns that you can exhibit in your body and the way that you're moving and your intention towards that. And so it's very external. Its focus is very external. And, and the two have very different knowledge sets and have very different pedagogy and have very different value systems. And so I talk about, like, my, one of my goals is like maybe trying to move that engineering, you know, if the engineer, you know, or if my classroom is the red thing, I'm always trying to push it a little farther um, to the right because I want engineers to value embodiment. Um, and, and, and one way that I try to do that is by broadening their idea about what dance is. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, dance is like this list of moves, and you're either doing dance or you're not doing dance. But let me read you something that might uh, challenge that way of thinking about dance. Um, I'm going to animate it because it's a little bit long. Um, but I think it's really the best uh, uh, way that I can describe how I think about dance as an academic body of knowledge. Um, so Catherine Elgin, a, a professor at Harvard, writes, Swan Lake is beautiful. It is delicate, graceful, enchanting. Here's a picture of Swan Lake. Martha Graham's night journey is not. It is riveting, harrowing, hor uh, horrifying, and often ugly. Yvonne Rayner's Trio A isn't even that. Being utterly pedestrian, it does not play on the emotions at all, but it is intriguing. Taken together, these three dances raise questions. What is dance up to? What does it do, and how does it do it? Night Journey discredits the thesis that the end of dance is beauty. Dance is not about making everything beautiful. Trio A discredits the thesis that the end is effective, with an A, meaning dealing with emotions, discredits the thesis that the end is effective engagement. Possibly dance as such has no end. Different works and different genres pursue different ends. But whether or not dance has a telos, questions arise. What does this particular dance do? How does it do it? My thesis is that dance embodies and conveys understanding. 
We emerged from a performance of such a work better equipped to recognize such features, political ideas, emotions, etc., in other situations where we encounter them. So she's saying that dance is about representing ideas through our bodies, and that choreographers are always innovating the kinds of ideas that we can express through our bodies. And that's a very different uh, lens to think about movement than what's the acceleration? What's the magnitude of the displacement, right? It's, a, it's, it's more about information and communication. Um, and so in my lab, we stand in a lot of dance studios, and, and we, um, this is from a summer workshop that we hold every summer, where dance artists come in and teach my students about how to move and how to, how to solve problems with your body and how to name what you're seeing in movement, how to take an idea you have about movement and put it on this person over here and communicate back and forth. Um, and we also do a movement hour every week where I lead some kind of, you know, not a dance class, but not, not a dance class uh, that helps the students understand their experience of movement um, and their experience of perceiving meaning from it. And we employ artists. So we've had two artists in residence so far. Uh, the first was Katie Kwan, who's now uh, getting a PhD in robotics here in the Bay. Um, the second, our current artist in residence is a woman named Kate Leidenheim. Both of these people come, and I think the position is like roughly a year and a half or two years. We say they have these two-week residency periods for two summers. And that's a long period of time to engage. And I think it's essential so that both sides get value out of it so that we don't have one creative cycle. We have many creative cycles. And you need many creative cycles to end up with something surprising. Um, and, and hopefully that, that teach my students uh, how to value their expertise, because they think of all these things the students don't think of. And then for the artists to value um, the, the, the creativity and the um, mm, uh, way of working of the engineers. And in that process, we make art. We put performances on stage. Um, this was a collaboration with the dance department at the University of Virginia, where um, you can see there's, there's a mocap uh, figure on stage that um, we hope to contrast with the live bodies that are, are dancing around it. Um, and often, we're running user studies in these performances. And we've learned so much about how to do that because we've done it terribly every time. But the, the, in, in, you know, one, the main thing that we've learned is that you can't just take a user study, take a dance piece, and then like put them together. The user study is going to interrupt how somebody experiences the dance piece. And so the two have to really be created in an integrative way. Um, but, but, but you can imagine this idea of test bed is quite literal uh, when we have people on their cell phones in the middle of the performance answering questions. So the rest of the talk, all the little things in the interior, are going to be things that I've learned or that artists and collaborators have taught my lab about this picture of communicating through particularly bodily postural change of, of mo in motion. Um, so the first one we will just start with is this idea of the channel. And an NSF program manager once told me to never use this example ever again. And so therefore, it's in all my talks now. Um, the task, the classic robotics task. Get from point A to point B. A blank slate, right? There's so many ways we could do that. We can walk in a straight line, we can walk in a meandering line, we can rotate on our way to point B, and we can, I don't know, luxuriate in the experience of movement, right? Okay, so now I'm going to change the task a little. Um, or, or so, so I walked freely to solve that. So now let me change the task. Um, walk from point A to point B in the presence of a friend. So now all of a sudden I realize that you're all here, and I need to you know, do my walk as if I really know what I'm talking about. And um, I'm not going to do that weird turn that I did before, because I don't want to look stupid. right? So now the task, actually just the presence of a friend changes the task. Now I need to try to not look stupid. 
Now we have this very blank slate, and I have these very blank slides, and let's give ourselves an environment to navigate. So now we need to get from point A to point B in the living room in the presence of a friend. Now we need to try to not look stupid while avoiding couches. This is something that robots are actually not terrible at doing, right? Roombas can do this. Um, what Roombas can't do is get from point A to point B in the living room while communicating anger to the friend. And now we're really thinking about an explicitly communicated message in some way. And the, to solve this task, we have to choreograph some movement. Um, I suggest that we flash our arms wildly and stomp our feet with heavy, sure-footed steps while avoiding couches to get from point A to point B. And I think that we would agree that, that that's probably a reasonable solution to this task. Is this expressive? Is this expressive movement? Have we entered the realm of dance? So now, same task, back to that original task, new environment. Get from point A to point B in a jungle. Well, unlike the living room environment where I have these discrete pods that I have to avoid, in the jungle, there is this wild and thick and chaotic undergrowth. And just to traverse as I walk, I need to really plant myself. And I need to move all of those things out of my way to get from point A to point B. So now, I need to slash my arms wildly and stomp with heavy, sure-footed steps. Well, I was doing this in the jungle in isolation. Now let's say I have an observer. So if a friend were present watching this movement profile, do they perceive anger? What do they perceive? What is communicated? Maybe. For me, I think it would be something about competence, maybe that I'm in a hurry, um, but I don't think it implies the same level of anger because I'm clearly moving branches out of my way to get from point A to point B. So this creates kind of, I think, maybe a moment where we need to stop and think because we have this two, the same motion profile in two different environments, and we're saying they communicate a different message. And one of them, on the right, we were very clear was about expression and expressing something. And on the left, we were just trying to get from point A to point B. We were just trying to do our job. And both of those needed a, a choreographed solution. Uh, a, a, if I couldn't stomp my feet heavily, if I couldn't wave my arms wildly, I wouldn't be able to do either of those things. And so this really, to me, this example highlights the indivorceability of function and expression. Um, this is the, word, the term that we use in the Laban community. Other people talk about form and function, um, maybe more in the product design context. And, and we represent the relationship between these two things with a Mobius strip, this idea that if you start on one side, you eventually end up back on the other side, and then you end up back on their side. It, that, that there's no, that you can, you can kind of foreground or kind of see yourself on one side or the other, but it gets really tangled up. So more expressive robots are more functional robots. And functional robots express stuff all the time. Um, so let's look at some research. This is not from my group. Um, but this is the kind of work that's very common um, in robotics and, and, in, and in thinking about how to design motion for social settings. And, and I hope that after my example, at least a couple of these labels are, are concerning to you, right? Because what is the happy gate? What is the sad gate? If, if we put those gates in different environments, does it hold up? And so that's what we did, and we tried that out. We took those original animations, and we put them in new environments. So for example, in the upper right corner, you see the happy gate on a field of garbage. Would you still label that happy? You could. Some people do. Um, but most people don't. So when we make these new videos and we ask people, what do they see in the movement? What does it mean? We get exactly what that example demonstrated. We find that, for example, the happy sequence in the upper left corner there gets labeled randomly. Like, it's, it's in blue is where people correctly labeled it happy. 
In red is where they labeled it something else. Most frequently, they labeled it feminine. Now, the one that does really well is the masculine sequence, this lumbering, wide-bodied, like, kind of exaggerated, silly notion of gender that's imbued in these little stick figures. It's nearly always labeled masculine across all these different environments. That's that blue stick that sticks up all the way. People are labeling the masculine sequence masculine. Um, and that kind of makes sense in that we think of gender as a more permanent idea um, than happy or sad um, or even tired or energetic or clearly ones that would, would vary in different environments. So we need to model the environment we need to model the context, just like a choreographer needs to decide what color lighting they're going to use and what the backdrop looks like and what um, uh, the program note says. So now let's talk about the person, the human viewer. And we've looked at things like the, fo the following, which was a completely academic uh, or, or um, uh, I don't know, we worked with a choreographer at Harvard who said, I hate this version on the right of Petite Mort. This is a famous ballet. And I love the one on the left. And both are executed by professional dancers. And I don't know exactly what it is that I'm seeing that is so different. And after a lot of brainstorming and talking, we decided it was something about the uprightness of the performers. Maybe we could try that. And that's what we're using to drive this video you saw earlier where we just monitor how upright the spine is, and we use that number, uh, one number in the case of the little mobile Roomba, and two numbers in the case of the little tipping broom, uh, to imitate that human motion. And I think they look kind of similar, and it's kind of a question of how could that be, right? That these so, those super simple, simple robots seem to be able to imitate this human in some way. So let's investigate a little. This is movement hour in the Rad Lab now. Are these two people doing the same thing? I'll let you watch it one more time. So these guys got a few takes to do this. Um, and still, their timing is a little off. Maybe their execution or gaze is a little dissonant. There's lots of things that we could clean up in rehearsal, right, with more time, with more repetition. Um, but it does sort of seem like, and, and the fact that I even think they're out of sync in time suggests that they are must, I mean, the, it suggests that there's some order or temporal pacing that is important uh, or some correspondence between what they're both doing. Like it looks like maybe they're both doing four things. Now let's look at this example. Everyone always laughs at this slide. You guys aren't paying attention. So um, what do we see now? I see, temp I see temporal synchronization. I think these two look like they're doing uh, something with the same beat or the same rhythm. And yet, they're doing something very different with all their body parts, right? Like, this guy's moving his arm, this guy's moving his head. Now they're both moving their arms, but in different planes. Now they both have this moment of flip, and then they both sort of do seem to do something low to the ground right there at the end. But they're different, so we could... Oh no, uh, PowerPoint crashed, so let me just restart it. I think it's not used to sitting there maybe for an hour. OK, so how did we ju oh, oh, let me, how do I do this? OK, so how did we create those sequences with this motif? And this motif comes from the Laban-Bartinieff movement system. It's a shorthand way 
of trying to notate certain aspects of movement. And rather than Laban notation, which tries to notate every aspect of movement, it's really about finding essence and, and overall, like it's a relaxed abstraction. So let me go back to our video. And what we see is that um, this notation, this sequence, has four things, arc-like directional mode of shape change, gather, flick, play slow. It's a taxonomy for describing like a very broad sense of movement. And it's one that would help us take the first two gentlemen and make them do the same thing better. And it's one that describes what is sort of vaguely similar about these next two gentlemen who, you know, like this moment right there, right, where they both, like it's a flick. It's a, mo it's a moment of quality that's quite in sync between the two of them. So what we're finding is that people can see something that's not the same and think that it looks the same. And this is a really important, like, weird thing. Um, we've been using this idea to think about how we can use motif um, and the idea of these broad abstractions about movement to create teleoperation um, in robots. So here's an example of on the left, the person is telling each joint exactly what to do. And on the right, the person is saying, move forward with a uh, far reach kinosphere. Um, and both kind of start and stop. They're using an Xbox controller to generate these movements. But this one on the left has that nice pull through at the end. And we are not a lab that is going to make the world's next teleoperation method. But what we are really interested in is how people perceived sending that command to that robot and how people perceive the resulting movement. Um, our sense of looking at it was like one seems to be a little more human-like than the other. This pull through at the end looks really coordinated. What is that about? How do we measure, not from the point of view of force, speed, acceleration, but from the point of view of maybe information and complexity. Um, and so we tracked how many joints are moving over time in each of those. And on the left, we have one joint. At one point, there are two joints. Baxter has these, uh, that robot has these soft compliant joints. So sometimes if it moves you know, a lot in one joint, another joint might wiggle a little bit. So there's a little moment of complexity there. And on the other side, we get up to six joints moving simultaneously, right? So we see this idea of instantaneous complexity kind of ramped up. And I presented this work at DARPA, and someone gets up after me and says, if you could teleoperate my robot, it could hold down a desk job. And right after me, and after I've been presenting this idea about teleoperation and how interesting it might be, and what happens, I think, in robotics is we have a culture of thinking you know, really about force, torque, acceleration, really about positional placement of end effector arms. And we call them arms, even though they aren't like human arms that have these like scapulas that can stretch. So I came up in response to this comment, uh, wrote a short article uh, with five examples of things that a, his teleoperated robot could not do. And I think what I hope the examples, and I'll explain each one of them, I hope the examples share this idea that um, it's not just about where the end effector is, that, 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 that there's more to movement that humans do that we maybe don't appreciate. So the first example was folding a piece of paper. And when we fold a piece of paper, we don't just use our fingers, right? We lay on top of it if it's really big and unwieldy, and then lay the other arm over. Um, picking up a paper clip. We don't just pick up one paper clip. We jam our hands in. We touch all the paper clips. Maybe eventually we get up one or two or three. It doesn't matter. Um, if those were linked together, a robot would be in big trouble. Sticking labels to yourself or to a piece of paper. When I stick a label to my hand, it's fine. I can peel it right back off. If I have plastic and metal and I stick a label to myself and it gets stuck and I ruin all the labels, I'm not going to hold down my desk job. And then the last, oh, then we had reaching and letting my scapula slide and wiggle around to grab something that's sort of outside my workspace. And then the final one was laughing at an inappropriate joke, which is a huge skill that you must be able to do at work. And you must be able to do it without seeming like you think it's that funny. 
So that's a very complicated border to find. And it involves not just your face, but also like maybe a little shoulder forward and chest back. But yeah, I'm laughing too, so a little upright bounce. So now we can finally talk about robots. And I'm going to talk about robots a little briefer than the other pieces, but, but it's, of course, core to a lot of what we do in my lab. Um, this is what we want, right? Now, the first thing I need to say is that C-3PO is played by a human, and there's a director off camera creating this scene. But I think it's a useful, motivating image. That's something we're trying to build. What are they doing in the image? And you know, even if you've never seen the movie, I think you see collaboration. You see working together. That's a high level inference that I'm making that's not actually written on the slide, right? It doesn't say Luke and C3PO are currently collaborating. I'm seeing that because of the way they're posed and the way they're relating to one another and the way their bodies are twisting and shifting. And I can write down what I see, the robot is pointing instructively out into the distance, leaning casually into its human cohort. And I really want to focus on this idea of discrete actions and these qualities of how the action is, is executed. And I want to ask, can all robots do this? And I think, I think, you know, it's rather evident to me, I hope, from the laugh, you know, it's probably not, but um, but, but I've spent a long time trying to convince roboticists that not all robots can do it. And that actually all movement's expressive, but some systems are more expressive than other systems. Some software-hardware combinations are more expressive than others. Um, so what I've tried to do is, in the first plot, categorize the internal complexity of every robot. And I do that by counting up the number of transistors on the computer that's on board. Um, and I'm plotting over time, and then on a log plot, the number of transistors, because these numbers get big really fast. In the middle, I'm plotting the number of shapes each robot can make, static postural shapes. How many different C3PO pictures could I get out of each robot? And I'd love to compare. That's like the external complexity of the robot versus the internal complexity of the robot. I'd love to compare those two things. Well, to do that, I need to say, you know, the number of transistors, how many internal states can the robot have, is actually two to the number of transistors. It's like a combinatorial problem. So to compare, I would need to do that, but those numbers get really big. So instead, I'm going to take the log base two, if you're curious about the mechanics, of the number of mechanical configurations, just so those two numbers are comparable. And now I take the two numbers and I put them on this third plot, and I see how has the internal versus external complexity of robots changed over the last 15 years. And it turns out the internal complexity has, now I have a log log plot. So each tick on this plot is an order of magnitude. I have an explosion of internal complexity. And the external complexity has been, if not flat, certainly there's no clear trend in, in the pattern. And I think that's um, just an interesting observation Again, if we're concerned about information and richness of the movement that's being exhibited, as opposed to um, the, the sequence of, of mechanical actions. And it sets up this idea of dancing partners, right? Like, which of these would you rather dance with? That was one of the questions at the beginning. The LED can communicate Moby Dick over time. It'll flash little Morse code lights. It'll be the most boring thing to watch ever. Misty Copeland can do way more than that all in each instantaneous moment. She can create lots of different ideas in her body. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a metric that, that makes a little more sense to me than, than human likeness, uh, because I don't know what it means to be human-like. So this sets up a bit of a... a, a design cycle in my lab. Um, we are the students in my lab, and I do have traditional mechanical engineering students that do graduate. And what they do is work on this problem of how many different things can I make a robot do. And 
we use a lot of qualitative analysis to achieve that. Um, this wordle, I love this wordle, um, because we are inherently dealing with these receivers that perceive strange qualitative features like human likeness or fluidity or grace that we don't really know how to quantify, or modern dance or flamenco or ballet, right, or Yvonne Rayner. We see these patterns, we name them, but I don't know how to quantify them. So I need to leverage qualitative analysis. We try to generate movement on artificial systems. Here I have this little picture of like, like a little drone flying through a simulation. Um, and this simulation upsets a lot of roboticists because we don't model the dynamics of the quadrotor. We don't model the dynamics of the quadrotor because we're just trying to figure out how to make something that looks different than something else, and that will inform almost a design challenge for the hardware people one day when we have that figured out. But well, you could work in lots of different ways, and sometimes we do model the dynamics. Um, and then we notate it. We use that motif that we talked about, and we try to say, what are we seeing in this motion? And we ask experts in dance, like Lisa Wymore, who introduced me, and we say, what do you see? Because you can see more, because you've been looking at movement all day, and we've been looking at code, and we don't see anything hardly sometimes. And then we ask lay people, too. And we ask broad groups of people, usually on mechanical turf, and they move on mechanical turf. And the other way we often work is we think, OK, this, what, what if we have a character or an idea that we want to express on stage, like Tristan and Isolde? To do Tristan and Isolde, you need at least two distinct robots whose movement looks distinct and hopefully also endows other character traits that are associated with these ideas that we're trying to present in movement on stage. And so we think about that in our design cycle, too, of, well, OK, I need probably four different colored robots, or I need four different movement profiles that I'm going to create on a particular platform, or maybe I'm going to play sound alongside. And we frequently use virtual reality to mock up all those ideas, try them out, and quickly change them out for something else if it doesn't work. Um, and then we often put these things on stage. And so this was a platform that a master's student built um, that was eventually used in a robot opera inspired from Tristan and his old. And then we go back and we think about, so he also was thinking about in-home robots for taking care of the elderly. So then it's like, OK, well, now we have to take some of these examples of movement, take them to stakeholders, show them to specific people in particular contexts, because that's really important, we've talked about. Um, and then we start all over, and we have this sort of weird interlooping like thing. And it's really important that robots can do these things. People do these things. And people do these things in, in, in order to create meaningful, functional moments in our lives, right? That, that, that this police, right, is, is, is exerting authority in the way that it, it, he moves. Um, that's important. If in the caregiving situation, always people are like, oh, you're going to make a robot that's really delicate and soft. Yes, hopefully, but also a robot that immediately, if it's an emergency, goes as fast as it can to the other side of the room and back so that you know that the system knows that this is an emergency and that we're not in the same mode that we were in when we were just recuperating. So this idea of situational context and narrative is really important. And I think that even in this case of manufacturing, and we've had projects in my lab funded by manufacturing consortiums, there is a, 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 a skill and a power that people have the ability to do lots of different patterns and changes with their, with their body um, that, that, that helps us create tools. I'm sorry, that helps us manufacture products. Um, we talk about sometimes you can imagine a manufacturing robot that needs to adjust for the amount of humidity in the air. I mean, that's what's so great about factories is they control everything. And if you weren't controlling humidity, you would need to be able to flick or dab or, you know, um, you know, delicately float paint on surfaces in different, uh, when the paint changes thicknesses. So not just about the pattern of the end point, but about the pattern of the whole body, um, I think shifts the, you know, exoticism of robots. I always say we need to try a, a litmus test. If you can't replace the word robot with hammer, you've said something odd, right? You've said something that's not no longer about a tool, but about an imagined magic that these tools might or might not have. Um, 
And when you look at it through the lens of how many different things can the robot do, the answer is usually one, right? The backflipping robot can do one backflip off one block of a very particular height in a very particular lighting setting in a very particular everything, right? So I hope that when you leave, you think about what an incredible mover you are already, whether you dance or not. And maybe you also respect the fact that taking on dance as a, as a true academic partner and equal with engineering can help us create really useful machines. So with that, these are the people that did the work, my students, my collaborators, um, funding agencies that enable what we do. And um, when this is posted online, there will be a long list of references to all the articles and contributors that, were re that each slide um, uh, represented. Do I, do I, yeah, yeah. Should I ask, shall we, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, yes. Oh. Yes, it's this row right here. Uh, so, uh, basically, I have uh, more of a comment. Uh, so, my field of interest is cognitive neuroscience, and I'm in particularly interested in uh, differences between the male and female brain. And there's an interesting uh, neuroimaging study that suggests that um, males, when they're either engaging in movement or perceiving movement, uh, use the left side of the brain. And when females do the same, either engage in movement or watch movement, use both the left and right sides. And if you um, look at the neuroanatomy, the differences, basic differences between the male and female brain, the corpus callosum which connects the two is typically larger in females. So anyway, the reason why I was pointing this out is because uh, you, you think of being in simplistically the left hemisphere being kind of linear and logic, all these points that you're making about the engineering students, whereas the right hemisphere more holistic, uh, qualitative versus the quantitative from the left hemisphere. Anyway, the reason why I was pointing this out is I think this would really complement this whole talk that you've done, these, these uh, uh, principles from cognitive neuroscience. Well, thank you, and I appreciate that, and, and I I think you're also saying that I'm better at my job than most of my colleagues, so I appreciate yeah, that also. No, actually, I have a funny way of putting it. This is the way I like to say it is, men may have bigger brains than females, but they only use half of it to do tasks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Hey, uh, a few years ago, I went to Japan and I saw the, I think the Honda robot, and it was fascinating. Uh, I would love to build a small robot myself that can, you know, dance. Any ideas where where can I look for for doing that, something like that? Well, uh, my first thought that I have to, you know, interject what I want to say anyway uh, is is that um, I think all robots are dancing. Right? All robots are exhibiting a pattern that expresses something when we watch it, whether we designed for it or not. Right? And that's why when you see like Roombas that are really have this very even movement pattern and maybe they're robotic looking, but people interpret stories about them and they create names for them. And apparently 85 or 90% of people name their Roombas. And, and, and they're really trying hard to make a very sterilized robot that is just vacuuming. Right? But we see meaning where it isn't. So you could do anything probably, right, and create a dance with that robot. Um, I know that's not exact. I mean, now I don't know. In terms of where to start, I say pair up with an artist who has an idea that they want to express through movement, and all of a sudden you'll have this, this tension between, OK, what, what should my dancing, because dancing can mean so many different things. It can mean you know, a, a wide variety of styles and a wide variety of movement patterns. So, 
that's my first. The second tip that I would say then is just find an artist and work with them because they have a whole set of expertise that, or they, I'm assuming you're an engineer, but maybe that's not right. Yeah, um, that, 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 that you might benefit from and, and vice versa. You've spoken about how engineering and, and dance and art have different knowledge sets and pedagogy and values, and how you've tried to bring some of um, some of that into your engineering classroom. Can you speak a bit about the differences in pedagogy and how it might be to, possible to close the gap? <laughs> well, I know nothing about teaching and pedagogy. I mean, I'm terrible at teaching. I'm always doing my research. I, I, but I will try to answer that question with that disclaimer because I, I, you know, I don't study education formally, right? But I experienced being an engineering student and being, you know, a dance student or trained, um, uh, particularly in the Laban Institute's program, and and the organization and the way information is generated or presented in those is often very different. The first thing I would observe is that in the, particularly when I was doing the certification program in at the Laban Institute. The material is kind of presented relatively quickly, like you, you get a lot of it, and then the rest of the time is spent cycling back through the material and deepening connections among many different objects. I think in engineering classes, we often are forced to, for good reason, but, but you know, present one tiny idea that's not you know, the whole picture in it by any means, and then add one more idea on top of that, and one more idea on top of that. And I don't mean to say that one is linear in like a pejorative sense, right? But that, that they just have slightly different structures in the way the information is presented. And I found this really hard to adjust to um, because I'm, I had spent more time in engineering classrooms. And um, the other thing, maybe I'll give an example, that, 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 that this is something I don't know how to language, and I think there is, knowledge in this world that you can't really language, that it lives in the body. And I think that might sound a little crazy, but, but the way that I take that feeling that I have and, and implement it in my classes, I always do in every class I've ever taught. And I've taught a wide variety. I mean, sometimes the fit for this topic isn't always great in my class, but I always try to teach about networked systems, this, this idea of these fish flocking that I talked about in the beginning. And the way I teach that class is I take all this, I write words on the board that these students have never seen. Distributed algorithm, uh, um, local interactions, network topology, information flow, like just words they've never seen um, that are related to this topic. And I say, I want you to write these down or take a picture of these. And then we go out on the quad and I say, okay, and I, I take one volunteer and I say, you go move over there, and you go move over there. I do a centralized algorithm, all right? Tell everybody where to go. And then I build up to the point where I take all the students and I say, okay, here are the rules for flocking. Like, you're gonna follow this person and you're gonna follow this person. And they go out on the quad and they move together according to these rules. The rest of the class is observing all these different cases of examples of movement and control of movement. And then the students that are writing, their job is to write paragraphs that use all these, ver these words that they've never really seen and don't quite know the meaning of to describe the four, usually I do four cases, um, of these like sort of hybrid, distributed and non-distributed. And I think you learn something different. Like when you're, part of your learning is like, oh, I'm, I, oh yeah, and I have to come this way, and then I need to orient with that person. And, you know, vers versus me standing up and saying, here are the principles of networked control, and here, let me give you the first most important one, and then the second most important. You know, I just try to give it to them all at once, and and to have them investigate it with their own bodies and movement and physical intelligence. Um, I don't know if that answered your. It's amazing. Thank you. Hi. Um, so. I mean, I've noticed that in, in research across robotics that's interested in incorporating knowledge from the arts, Laban gets a lot of um, play. It does. And I, I imagine, although you can speak to this, that's because it, it does such a thorough job of defining variables or slots that, you know, can be translated pretty easily into algorithms. Um, but I wonder, in all of your qualitative work with general audience members or with expert dancers, um, whether you've encountered uh, 
of frustrating limits of that paradigm, um, of, of the Laban okay. paradigm, and what you do when you encounter those limits? That's a great question. Um, and it gives me a great opportunity to say something important, which is that you, know, you said, oh, that it's fairly easy to translate these ideas about movement into algorithms. And I think it's terrible. I mean, the Laban system is completely all those, the, cert, the source, the receiver, the channel, all those things are, are not broken apart in that world. It's, it's, it's how people perceive movement. And so we have to disentangle ourselves almost from the, so it's not easy. And, and in fact, I write papers and I say, oh, here's lightweight effort, and here's strong weight effort, and here's indirect space. And, and, and I don't do, I do the exact thing that I'm criticizing us about with robots, which is that I don't have that modifier. Like, this is really policy gradient lightweight effort. Is like what I should be saying, right? Because it's not, you know, and we don't frequently do. It's like it's not an arm. It's a manipulator. It's a, you know, we don't we don't put those modifiers on very regularly in robotics. And so, I've never successfully taken any idea from the Laban system and put it on a robot just by trying for like ten years. This has not happened yet, right? And and I think or. It hasn't happened in a complete holistic way that completely makes sense. And I think, um, so a limit of the, of the system is that it's so holistic and so integrated and so about finding out your own preferences of movement and your own ways of seeing things. And that's inherent in the, in the, in the pedagogy and personalizing the material to your experience as part of everything. It's all entangled. So you can't quite disentangle all the elements in the nice way that you might like, which is which is, I mean, that's why it's such a useful material, that it is so holistic and so uncomfortable. But, but, you know, so I think that that, you know, reduction, you know, reductive versus inductive or something, like idea of, of thinking about the whole complexly versus thinking about the parts. We call it part whole, actually, in the Laban system. But, so did that answer your question? I, I, you know, so I think that, and I don't know, I think Laban gets mileage because it's to some extent written down more than other what I call choreographic technologies. Right. And it's also um, tantalizing that we could just, oh, quickly take that idea and put it in an algorithm. But it's so much, but I mean, lightweight effort is not just about the trajectory of motion of my hands, it's also about the musculature of my body, it's also about the context that I'm surrounded in, it's, you know, it's about all the things. And then we have to kind of use it as a guide, but also recognize that it's a natural phenomenon that, <laughs> that we've named movement. Right, and it's not. It's, I mean, it's, just, it's not really a scientific method, right? It's 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 more about experience and naming your experience and finding ways to articulate what you're seeing. Okay, one. one. Oh, sorry. This oh. is a two-parter. So. <laughs> oh, well, um, I guess you can ask, maybe only ask one part. I yeah, don't know. I'll, I'll try and make this quick. Two parts, fine. Okay, two parts. So. Fine. Um, I'm sure no shortage of roboticists have come up to you uh, and said, well, you know, I don't want my employees to, you know, bend over while working or pretend to laugh jokes. I would actually prefer no jokes to be told in the office because, you know, I want robots to just replace my employees and do their function at max efficiency. Um, so... <laughs> Well, that it goes back to the the very first, you know, the, the CapEx play where he's talking about the idealized worker. That is this very inherent idea about robots that I, that I would really push against because I think it overemphasizes function and underemphasizes expression and all the things that we need because as social animals, we, we do have to social, you know. But, but go ahead. I don't know that we have to socialize with all the robots sure. that work for us. Well, I, I guess that leads into the second part of my question, which, you know, you, at the end you mentioned like caretaking robots and, um, to me, there, there's sort of this conflation between like performativity of being a caretaker versus like an actual human being like doing the caretaker. Um, you know, I, pers I I think I don't know if like socially w as a population we're ready for robots to replace humans as you know that role, even if the technology were there. So I'd be I don't think the technology will be. The, I that. don't think the technology will be there for like a hundred or two hundred years. I, I actually believe that, and I think I believe that because I recognize the complex human need that. Well, I don't know. I don't know anything about caregiving, but but I I I sense that it's a very complex task, and and 
I think I think it's a much more complex task than many of my collab, you know, than many of the people that work in robotics. And I think, um, and I think you're thinking about the right questions. Like, is that an ethical thing to be doing? Uh, you know, we need to think about that carefully. I think, from my point of view, what motivates me to work in the space is that that there is a shortage of caregivers, and there is the seeming increasing number of of people that need care, particularly uh, aging. Um, and older adults, and um, so we we have a need, and we want to. It can't be filled with only robots, though, and I, and I don't think it will be filled with only robots for a very long time. And we have we can make choices about what that looks like and how we sort of, you know, which parts of the problem we automate versus which parts of the problem we can't automate. I mean, can human bodies express the same ideas as robot bodies? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. And I think there are things you, I, I mean, I think I might sound like I'm afraid to say this loud. I think I sound like a crazy person. But I think there are things you can't automate. And I think there are things that people do that machines cannot do because they are not biological, mysterious creatures that we are. I don't know. But that, don't take, don't, 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 don't repeat that. But that's what I think. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> we have you on video. Yeah. Uh, um, I just got handed the microphone, which I think is um, a sign for me to close. But I also did have a question, so I'll just close it with a comment before thanking you, which is, I think that you get different questions depending on the the discipline from which they're coming. And so you have engineering questions or you had like a performance studies question. So I'll ask something more from dance and performance studies on top of Chris's last question. Um, or get it out there. In yeah. the, that I just actually even wonder about the word expression and expressive um, and that you're using that in your subtitle and actually many, many times throughout. Next to say the dance genealogy that you are, that you put reinforced um, where expressiveness would be associated with Martha Graham and it would not be associated with Yvonne Rayner. And just to sort of say, um, once you really take seriously the dance genealogy in that pursuit, can you even use that term in the same way? Um, and perhaps even more to the point, is there, or to a diff slightly different point, is there even perhaps something historically about the 20th century trajectory in the robot, in automation, that is coinciding with Yvonne Rayner's um, practice. So that the automatedness of a Jetson type choreography is actually coming about because, actually because robots started to come about. <laughs> Anyway, just to say that there, there might be a real synthesis between the history of robots and tra the tra trajectory of dance innovation, actually, that are emerging. But once you take that seriously, you can't call it expression anymore. <laughs> OK. No, so, so, so I think that's a wonderful point. And I think it really underscores why these two disciplines need to be in conversation together. The word expressive is already being used by roboticists. And actually, the whole goal of my talk is usually to pull on that and say, OK, but, but, but in, in the, in the, not in the same sense that you're using the word expressive, but in the sense that, that all movement expresses some idea, something, some topic, as opposed to here's the expressive motion, here's the non-expressive motion, and, and I don't know. But, but, but you're right. But like, I, I'm not entitled to, to, to tell everyone how to use the words. And, and we need an interdisciplinary conversation about how to use the words. And you are launching that great, often awesome interdisciplinary <laughs> conversation. We thank you so much, Amy, for thank being you. here. Help all of us thank her. Thank you.